Thank you, present worshiper. <laughs> this um, <clears throat> we be seated. <clears throat> we open. We are going to read uh, one verse in unison, which is James four, verse seven. That we are going to read in unison, James four, verse seven. I will still read Ephesians six from verse ten. That's the same verse that we read last week. I'm still there. I haven't moved from there. Let me go ahead and read. The whole armor of God. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wells of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against the spiritual host of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand in the day of evil, and having done all, to stand. Take it there. Let's go and read in unison James 4 verse 7. Are you there? James 4, verse 7. Yeah, James 4, verse 7. We have uh, two Jameses here. And the Lord Jesus said his own James in the disciples. Ah, yeah, two Jameses also in the disciples. Okay, good. Are we there? James 4, verse 7. We are going to read in unison. Let's read. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Let's read it again. Therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Father, in the name of Jesus, we submit to you today. We come before you, Lord, with thanksgiving. You were telling us early this morning that you, Lord, us with blessings and benefits. And we believe it. And we believe your word. That you continue to load us with blessings and benefits because we are children. When children come to the father asking for fish, there is no father who can give them a snack. If they come asking for bread, there is no father who give them a rock. If our own fathers here on earth, some of whom are wicked, know how to give good gifts to their own children, how much more the Father in heaven. So you load us with benefits, and we are thankful. This morning, to be hearing this word, it is a benefit. Some people have died. Some people are on the ventilator. Some people are in different situations that they cannot even have an opportunity to hear this word. But by your mercy and by your grace, you have given us life, You've given us energy. You've given us all what we need even to dwell in the presence of the Lord. We thank you this morning and we bless your name. We soak the word that is going to come from this altar. Lord, let it not be about me. Let it be about you. Let me be just a vessel that you use this morning to speak to your children. Your children are at different levels. You are taking them from wherever they are to greater glory, from glory to glory to glory. And so we thank you this morning for what you are doing in their lives. And I, was, I want to thank you, Father, for what you are also doing in my life. For you also take me from glory to glory. Holy Spirit, if your way, we ask you to come and take over everything that is happening in this place. We submit it to you. And we said, have your way, Spirit of the living God. There are some who are sick, some who are home. We plead the blood of Jesus. If there's any such who is sick, we decree healing in the name of Jesus. Amen. We use the authority that we have been given by Christ Jesus to decree healing. Some are writing difficult exams. Some are in the last semesters there looking for jobs. You know the different situations that your children are in. And I plead the blood of the Lamb over them. And I say, Lord, you are the one who is going to grant victory unto them. For victory has been granted unto us even through Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. Some, O oh Lord, are looking for properties to buy. And I plead the blood of Jesus that, Lord, 
give them the right properties. Some, they are looking for business programs and deals. Yes, oh Lord, open those doors. Some, they just want to grow in Christ, in the things of the Lord. Oh Lord, help them. You know where we are and take us from where we are to greater glory. Through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Amen and amen. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. I'm going to still continue talking about the authority of the believer, part two. Perhaps it's going to be a series. Last week we introduced the topic, the authority of the believer in Christ Jesus. I believe that we learned a few things. I was just thinking some of the nuggets from that sermon. What we heard is that a child of God was given authority by God since Adam. Adam was given authority to name everything. Number two, a child of God can lose the authority just as Adam. Adam had authority and Adam lost authority. Number three, our Christian authority is from God through Christ Jesus. Our Christian authority is from God through Christ Jesus, who is the second Adam, who come to give the first Adam the authority that he had lost. Number four, Jesus Christ died in order to redeem the Adamic race and reinstate them of their original authority. Number five, the Holy Spirit was given in Acts 2 so that the children of God have power and authority to do God's work and exploits on the earth. Number six, we were given authority over the devil. Luke 10, 19 say, Behold, I give you power to tread on the serpents and the scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Number seven, we have spiritual weapons to overcome the devil. And those weapons were spelled in Ephesians 6, are uh, even uh, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, uh, the readiness to spread the gospel, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, <coughs> which is the word. Number eight, we use our authority in wisdom. We use our authority in wisdom. Ephesians 5, verse 15 to 16. See that... Then ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time because days are evil. Number nine, there is authority in agreement. We learn that there is authority in agreement. When two or three are gathered in my name, I will be there with them. So if you want God to come to our situation, we just have to gather two or three. I'll be there with them and whatever they bind on earth, it is bound in heaven. Whatever they loosen on earth, it is loosened in heaven. We also hear one chest is a thousand, two chest is ten thousand. That's authority in agreement. That's authority in agreement. I always want to use this opportunity to tell people who are married that you guys, you are dynamites because you are two. So at any given time, you pray together, and you can move 10,000. Uh, if you are not yet married, find a prayer partner. <clears throat> Number 10, we have to use our authority in practical situations. This authority that we are talking about is not theoretical. It is real authority. When you are going for an interview, you speak to the interview. You are going to write an exam, you speak to the exam. When you are going for business trip, you speak to the business trip. So speak to situations. 
Jesus had that tendency of speaking to situations. And sometimes speak to even inanimate objects. Jesus spoke to the wind. And the wind listened. Jesus spoke to diseases. And the diseases listened. So we use authority in practical situations. In healing, speak to your body. You, my body, I know you've been struggling for some time. Hear the voice of the Lord. Be healed in the name of Jesus. I command you by the authority that I have in Christ Jesus, be healed. Number 11, our authority is begged by one who gave us authority. It's just like a policeman. A policeman has authority, but he has given that, that authority by the government. So the government is the one that begs the authority of the policeman. He can arrest you on behalf of the government. So we can jurisdict things on earth on behalf of the one who gave us authority, on behalf of God. <coughs> we also learn that there are things that compromise our authority in Christ. That was the last part. We learn that sin compromises our authority that God has given us. Just like what he did with Adam. Adam had a lot of authority that the devil was even envious of Adam. But because of his fall, he lost the authority. Number two, we also learn that when you backslide, you are trading in a ground where you lose your authority. Number three, we said prayerlessness makes you to lose your authority. Number four, unrighteousness. And the last one was ignorance. Not knowing the authority that you have makes you the enemy to steal from, from you. Today, we want to talk about what Apostle James says in James 4, 7. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. I want that to sink in your spirit. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. <clears throat> Apostle James Right there, around there, he did not tell us how to resist the devil. So today, that's what I want to just touch a little bit. How to resist the devil. Because he just gave us a nugget. Submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee away from you. The Bible does not say, he may flee away from you, or he might. He says, he what? He will. If we submit to God, if we resist the devil, he will. It will happen. The devil is the arch enemy of God and therefore the arch enemy of every believer. You cannot belong to God and belong to devil at the same time. These are opposite poles. Either you belong there or there. And I know you guys where you belong. You belong to God. I want to say something with caution here. That a lot of things that we experience in this earth realm originates from the heavenly realm. A lot of things that we experience here in the earth realm originates from the heavenly realm. What we learn from Ephesians is that we do not fight against principalities and powers. Flesh, I mean, we don't fight against flesh and blood, which is human beings. These are the people with flesh and blood. But we fight against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, and host of wickedness. These are four levels. There are other levels that are above that. That's what we fight against. But the Bible situates where do they live? In where? In heavenly places. So the fight that we are fighting here on earth is originating in the heavenly realms. And if you do not know your enemy, how do you fight and overcome your enemy? Because we take much of our time focusing on this person, which is flesh and blood, 
instead of focusing on the what is behind the person. Because that's what is behind the person is what is coming from the heaven in the realm. So a lot of things that we experience on the earth realm originates in the heaven in the realm. And the enemy doesn't want us to know that. The attitude of most Christians about the devil is that is the one of fear. People fear the devil, are scared of the devil. They make it taboo to talk about the devil. Just talk about Jesus Christ. That's all. Don't, don't, don't talk about the devil. Because most Christians are paralyzed with fear when you start to talk about the devil. They think that when you start to talk about the devil, he's going to come after us. I remember one of the uh, pastors uh, in this city uh, who has been a pastor back in Africa. I don't want to situate the country. And uh, he worked in the northern part of the country where witchcraft is rife. And I'm talking of rife, where you see uh, a person running towards you, right? And immediately changed to be a dog. With your eyes, I'm talking of things that have been recorded, that have been seen. And he has been a pastor in that region. So when he started to, his wife to come to this church, uh, he told his wife that, please, please don't come to the church. Uh, because you know what? You know, they, they cast the demons, they cast the devil. Uh, you know, I, 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 we are so scared of the devil. We don't have to be afraid of the devil. So the attitude of a Christian is not to be afraid of the devil. We are not afraid of the devil. What was the another attitude? So God did not give us a spirit of fear. But we were given a spirit of what? Power, love, and sound mind. That's what we have. So you are not going to live in fear. You are not going to be afraid Another attitude towards the devil is that he is a defeated fool, a useless thing, a powerless thing. He cannot do anything against me. So we have two attitudes. One is terror to fear the devil. The other one is just to dismiss him altogether. I want you to know that both these attitudes are not helpful to a child of God. Because both fearing the devil or dismissing the devil lead to unpreparedness to a child of God and also it leads to defeat. That's why the Bible says be sober and be vigilant. Peter says that. Be sober and be what? Vigilant. The devil is like what? A rolling lion trying to find who to devour. So you have to be sober and be vigilant. That's the attitude of the Bible. To us here are on earth. Not to fear him not to dismiss him, but to be sober, but at the same time, vigilant. Apostle Paul in Ephesians 6, that we have read, he says, be strong in the Lord. Just see the language which is used here. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his mighty. Put on not part of the armor of God, the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the the devil's schemes or wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle. I want you to see these words. Be strong. Have the whole arm of God. Be able to stand. I want you to be able to wrestle. See the language there. You can't just dismiss that. Right? For we do not wrestle against our flesh and blood. But we do wrestle against principalities and powers and rulers of darkness and spiritual host. Hosts are any armies. So the devil is armies. Just as God is heavenly hosts, which are angels of wickedness, which dwell in heavenly places. Apostle Paul here tells us two things. Uh, that the right attitude towards the devil is for us to be vigilant. Be sober and be vigilant against the devil in this demonic system. He also said be strong be able to stand, be able to wrestle. He also tells us that we have the armor of God. 
that we can use in order to stand against the devil. So there is a problem and a solution that is in the same place. So verse 13 say, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the day of evil and having done all to stand. The language that is used there, you can't just dismiss the devil. You can't just dismiss him. You have to be sober, be vigilant, be know who your enemy is and be able to fight against your enemy. <clears throat> Let it be done on earth as it is in heaven. What do they do in warfare on earth? They spy over the enemy that they are fighting against so that they can learn all the secrets of the enemy. In the past, they had to, stand, to send physical spies to go to Iraq or to Iran. They stay there. They even marry there and stay there. But their job actually is to spy and find information about the enemy. Then with time, of course, technology comes. Now we have drones. Drones are flying. If you hear how many drones are flying in the atmosphere, gathering information. Submarines are always under, going around the whole world gathering information from cities. All what we are trying to do is to spy our enemy, to know what ammunition do they have, what capacity do they have, so that in terms of war, we know for sure where to hit them so that we can overcome them. Those who do not spy, they are defeated. They are surprised in the day of evil. They are surprised when the enemy attacks. And you don't even know where the enemy is hitting you from the back or from the front or from wherever. All what you know is you are falling down. So we have to know there's nothing wrong about us to know the enemy that we fight against. So that when we are using the authority, the God-given authority, we are going to use it precisely to overcome the enemy. Let me go back to the thought that a lot of things we experience on earth comes from the heavenly realm. Its origins is the heavenly realm. And the, de the devil does not want you to know that. If there's one thing that I can say the devil has been successful in doing is in deceiving people that he doesn't exist. I can tell you that a lot of churches, they think that a devil is just like a it's just a phallus. It's just some, some words. They did uh, a, a research, and most Christians were said they don't really, really believe that the devil is there. The majority of Christians. Even though the Bible says he is there. And the devil has been successful in hiding. What symbolizes the devil uh, on earth is a snake, right? The serpent. <laughs> Let me tell you what happens with serpents. It's nature, they're smart. I'm talking of earthly serpents. <coughs> there are serpents that, most of the serpents that live in the Amazon region where it's green all the time. They are green snakes. Right? When you go to deserts, the snake itself looks like a desert. When you go to Africa, there are many snakes. <laughs> They tend to live where they can camouflage. The idea of wearing a camouflage of soldiers, we learn it from nature. We learn it from the snakes. They camouflage. Of course, the thing that camouflage is more than anything is a chameleon that can even change according to what is in the environment. So what snakes does, if uh, they live in a green forest, most of them, they live there are green. So you can be climbing a tree in order to get a fruit and you just hear, but you could not even see that there was a snake because it camouflages whatever the environment is. That's what the devil does. He camouflages the situation so that you do not think that there's a devil behind. You think that things are just happening. They are just happening. The Bible calls the devil the God of this world. Have you ever thought about that? 
how can the Bible call with a small g the God of this world who has blinded the minds of the whole world? He also called him the prince of the power of the air. Ephesians 2, 1 to 2. John 1, 1 John 5, 19 says, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. This is Jesus saying this. So, yeah, he has some power here on earth. That's why when he was thrown from heaven on earth, we heard in Revelations, who unto the earth? Because what has happened? The enemy has been thrown unto you. Why who unto the earth? Because there is a formidable enemy who has been thrown unto you. Rejoice, you heavens. Because the devil is no longer here. But he is now on, on earth. I want us to have the right attitude. So that when we are praying, we pray with swords that do not miss. We pray with swords that do not miss. He is the one who releases sicknesses. Most, if not all sickness, there is a spirit behind. Poverty. Sin. He deceives people into unbelief. There is a spirit behind most problems that we have. And if you know that, when you pray, you are not going to deal with the persons around. You deal with the spirits behind he takes advantage of us mainly in this world because of our secular education. He makes us to believe that most of the things are natural or most of the things are physical. They are not spiritual at all. Because that's our whole education. We are trying to find what is the problem and what is the solution, what is the problem, what is the intervention, what are the strategies, what are that. And it's great to do that. And I'm not trying to speak down against secular education. But I, it, it kind of... Uh, makes us to look at things more physically. So, to the point that sometimes we miss when there's a spiritual phenomenon that is happening behind. That is happening behind. We therefore spend uh, some time trying to figure out how to intellectually solve problems. Sometimes we have solved them, later they return again, and we wonder why the problem is persistent. We put lots of money to solve problems that money cannot solve. I can tell you a story of a family from where I come from. Uh, this family have alcoholism. Alcoholism. Those guys, they drink. Their grandfathers, they drink. And after they drink, they just sleep where they drink. And people have to bring a wheelbarrow. Do you know what a wheelbarrow is? Yeah. Or a scotch cart to carry them. This is the grandfather's level. The father's level, they drink and also they fight at, at beer halls, and beer places. It's, the, this same, it's not one family. It is um, like, you know, the Nyarambis, all the Nyarambis, uncles, uh, you know, all of them, they are known for fracas. They are known for drinking. To the extent that the little boys who were in second grade, who ran away from school to go to find beer. I'm talking of second grade. They have already tested and enjoyed beer. You can say there's something in the DNA. That's what, what I was just talking about. <clears throat> yes, the, but there's someone who created the DNA. And there's someone who fights the DNA. So what is behind? That family, they dealt with alcoholism so bad. One of the young boys, he was in form 2, grade 9, grade 10, there about, and he received the Christ Jesus. And he started to come to the church that I was going when we were growing up. We had a time of fasting, you know, in, in December, preparing for the new year. And uh, the pastor would say, you know, <clears throat> all what you, you need to have in this place is your Bible and anointing oil. Don't bring anything. One after the other. Come, let me release the power of God over you. And as he prayed for this young man, a demon came out. He fell down on the ground and a demon came out. And the demon says, No, you cannot take my beer from me. Give me beer. Give me beer. A little boy 
the spirit is talking about beer and all sorts of stuff. And uh, with time, he was scratching his mouth because he was feeling the, the, the sourness of beer. And the spirit was casted out of him. From that day, he is the only one in the family whose life changed and changed completely. That's when we knew that this alcoholism in this family is not just the love of beer. It is a, a spirit. There is a spirit behind drugs and alcoholism. And we can have interventions, detoxing and all those kind of stuff. They can work to some extent. But people can relapse if there's a spirit behind. You know, I always joke about my continent and I joke about my country. I remember very well because I was very young because we were listening to the radio a lot and TV a lot. When we got independence, I was like very, 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 very young. And I remember every day we were hearing and the Canadian government have given five million, sometimes uh, 50 million. Uh, and the Australian government have given this, you know, they were giving money to a new independent country. And I'm not going to go to the politics of it, why they were giving money and stuff like that. But I just want to say they were giving money. And the American government have given 300 million. And then the British government has given this amount of money. The money that was flowing in Zimbabwe in the 80s, getting to 1990, it was scary. To the extent that if the president had elected to say, I want to give away only 13 million, I want to give everybody a million, it was possible. The money was flowing in the country. So by now, we were supposed to be a second world country or perhaps a first world country. The money was there. But the poverty that is still found in the country, there is a spirit behind. There's a, it's a spirit of poverty. This is the reason why you hear that. When people won lotto, lottery and they win uh, millions of dollars, just to give them five years to ten years, they no longer have any said they are being evicted from the houses. Why? Because there's a spirit of what? Of poverty. How can you have a lot of money and tomorrow you don't have anything at all? So there's something behind. That's what we need to target with our authority, God-given authority. We have to find out what it is. And we have to deal with that. And I'm by no means saying all problems in life are spiritual in origin. No. I totally understand that us as human beings, we are so creative. And we can generate a lot of our own problems on our own. We are very creative in making our lives very miserable. But there are some problems whose origin you can just tell this is spiritual. So those problems that are spiritual in nature, we need to fight them with the authority that God has given us. Uh, we, I have a family that I've shared about, I think, in the past, in, in where I grew up. All the males in that family, they die before or by 50. All the males. All the females, they live until the 80s and the 90s. Yeah. They, they, they were very close to us. I think our distance is just uh, here in the next gas station. And uh, one of them was an army corporal. And he was rising in the, in the ranks. He was in the 40s. And he built a mansion in the village. He had a mansion in the city. He had good life. He, ne he never had children. And uh, he was saying, I have to enjoy my life in the 40s. Right. 49, he died. His brother was a businessman. And, you know, these are people who started businesses so early. So they had business all over the place. Uh, then later on, he became sick. And when he became sick, he became a pastor. 
And uh, he was a prayerful man. When he came to funerals, he would preach the word of God. Exactly at 50, he died. The same family, uh, <clears throat> they are uh, three brothers who were living in the, in the village. They were well to do by the standards of the village. All of them, they died. They died before 50. Their sisters, their aunties, their wives, they will live up to old age. But the men die at that level. There's nothing to do with the DNA here. It is not DNA. We are dealing with what? A spirit. We are dealing with a, a spirit. I talked with uh, one of their sons. He is in the 40s he's in Colorado. Talked with him some few years ago. And I said, uh, how are things? And he says, you know what? I'm trying to enjoy life in the 40s. Yeah. He's a software engineer. Makes a lot of money. He says, I'm trying to enjoy. You know what happens in our family. And he says, I have been going to all the juju people on earth that you can think of. And we always think that the juju people in the other country are better than those in your country. <laughs> so he's been going to, to Nigeria. And <laughs> <laughs> and, 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 there's another country in, 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 in West Africa. Yeah, yeah, and in Benin. Because he has the money to fly. He has been flying. And I said, uh, you know what? <laughs> Nigeria is a blessed country. The Lord has put a lot of prophets in that country. You better go to prophets, real ones, and you, you come better come back better. And he's afraid of death. He is not a Christian. When I tried to talk to him about Christ, oh, he just, that's the last time that we talked anyway. He never wanted to have a conversation with me. And he's trying to enjoy his life in the 40s. Because he doesn't know what 50 can, can bring. There is a spirit behind. As, as if the spirit is not dealt with, then uh, by 50, who knows? In some families, only those who become Christians and remain Christians are the ones who enjoy the marriages. If uh, you do not be a Christian, a child of God, you find out that things are not going to work out. 10, John 10 verse 10, call him a thief. Uh, and he says, the thief comes in order to steal, to kill, and to destroy. This is the reason why Jesus said to announce to his disciples that all power is given to me in heaven and on earth in Matthew. And in Luke 10, 19, he gave us power uh, to us to tread on the devil, the serpents, and the scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing by any means yet us. If we genuinely receive the power of God, uh, and the power of God resides in us, we are supposed to be a terror to the devil. If we are children of God, we are supposed to be a terror to the devil, not us to be terrorized by the devil, not us to be afraid of the devil. We have authority. So for us to overcome the devil, let me finish up. We are taught to resist the devil and he will flee away. So I want just to finish up in the next few minutes to talk about how to resist the devil. How to resist the devil. But the Bible says, submit to God resist the devil, and he will flee away. There's a precondition here. Submit to, to God. You cannot resist the devil without submitting to God. Because your power comes from what? From submitting to God. Submit to God. So I would want you just to think very quickly. How do we submit to God? What do I do practically? To submit to God. Because there's a precondition of submitting to God. Once you submit to God, you can resist him. He is now a defeated fool. Why aren't you what? You submit yourself to God. It is now easy to overcome. But if without submitting to God, submitting to God has an aspect of surrendering to God. My life, I give it unto you, O Lord. My health, I have surrendered unto you. My situations in life, 
I've surrendered them unto you. I just want you, if for a minute, just to come out of your, your phone. You can be on your phone when you, after church. Uh, my relationships, I've submitted them to you. My marriage, I've submitted it to you. My finances, I've submitted it to you. When you submit, when you surrender everything, and when you give every part of your life unto the Lord, if you submit everything, then the enemy finds it very hard to fight those areas. Sometimes we struggle uh, with um, marriage because we haven't submitted to God ourselves in that marriage. Because in marriage, how many people? Yeah, two, three is a crowd. Just two, right? It is two people. But you cannot expect your wife to behave in a certain way when you do not sub when you do not behave in a certain way. Right? That's cheating. Do not expect ye to be a nice lady, you know, doing everything, but you yourself you are mean. It doesn't work like that. Submit yourself to God first, and she submits to God, and you find out that your marriage just goes well. So submitting to God is very important. Submitting to God is very important. You want your children to be the best, but you don't teach your children the word of God. How can that be? So they are submitting to God is an aspect of what? Surrendering. There are some things that you need to surrender. Surrender your health to the Lord. When you surrender your health to the Lord, you are going to be very careful what you eat. You are going to be very careful what comes in the temple of God. Right? So if surrendering, and surrendering is not the easiest thing. Surrendering is the most difficult thing. But as a child of God, if it's surrendering to God, it has to come what? Naturally. Surrender your job unto the Lord. Lord, this job is in your hands. I am going to work in this job as much as you want me to work in this job. When that time comes, oh Lord, for me to leave this job, I surrender. Take it off and give me another. Do not hold to a job to the point of you no longer go to church because of your job. You no longer have time to pray because of your job. You no longer have time to fellowship because of your job. Once you do that, you have made your job your God. You did, you did not surrender. I am not saying you may not miss church here and there because of your job. Yes, there's a day that, you know, you, 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 you run to do something. I understand that. But make sure that your job is no longer your, your God. The reason why sometimes we remain in poverty because we have not yet surrendered our wealth to the Lord. If you are a person who really, really struggle just to give a tithe to the Lord, just a tithe, he, gives, he says nine out of ten is what? Yours. Just give me a tithe and see how much I'll open the windows of heaven. If you just fail to submit, you find out that you can work 24-7 and there's going to be a tragedy one time that all the profit that you've got is gone. You remain in what? In poverty. Because you haven't submitted that area. So we have a lot of submissions as children of God that we need to do. It's part of submit to God. Then when you resist the devil, you can overcome the devil. There's a situation that I was in. <clears throat> I'm not going to give you much detail. But the detail I can give you, I needed some, some money. Uh, and there was some situation whereby the way that I get this money, someone wanted to take that opportunity from me. So I just came before the Lord here. Yeah. And I said, Lord, I thank you because all the money that I have belongs to you. If you ask me to give it to anybody who is in need, I have done. So all whatever I have is yours. Lord, I see these people standing on this way so that I won't get this opportunity. If I get this opportunity, you know 
that a tithe of it is going to the house of the Lord and is going to help someone who is in need of the work of the Lord to go on. Uh, but these people are standing in this situation. So they formed a committee to discuss whether who is supposed to be given this opportunity or not. And I was not part of that committee. And they met. And I said, Lord, divide their tongue. There's nothing wrong about praying about that. <clears throat> when someone is trying to steal from you, you can pray, the spirit that is behind, divide the, the tongue. They met. <laughs> oh my goodness. The report that I heard, I heard it was fireworks. It was fireworks. And the administration pulled back. And the next week, I receive an email. Uh, we are wondering if you are interested in this opportunity. Uh, and if you are interested, we give you double. Uh, I was not even asking for double. I was just asking for one, which was good enough for me. We'll give you double. So I don't know why the email ends up coming to me. I'm not even part of that committee. But fireworks happened over there, and things changed. And I know now that the Lord has secured this for me. Because I've surrendered my pocket unto the Lord. Right? So surrender, surrender your marriage unto the Lord. I find some women fighting in the marriage until we are getting into the 50s and 60s, and you are still fighting. You are fighting because you haven't surrendered it unto the, unto the Lord. So surrender. Today we are going to have a short prayer of just surrendering. I surrender all. You have to surrender all. If there's any area that you are still fighting against it for too long, either you have not surrendered it, or the Lord is using that area to perfect you. So find out what's happening. So we have talked about submitting to, to God. Submitting to God as to reading the word of God. I mean, be a person who enjoys to read the word of God. Please, just be a person who, if, if you don't enjoy to read the word of God, guess what? Pray about it. Say, Lord, please give me enjoyment in reading your word. Give me enjoyment in your word. You know, I, I have uh, people that have not back home. When the word of God is being read, they cannot sit down. Have you seen people like that in church? They cannot sit down. I'm not talking in bread of life. In other churches that you've gone. They cannot sit down. The whole service, they will be standing. And they are the ones who say, Amen. And you can tell how they are enjoying. When you call them to talk to them, you can tell that this is a person who is so much soaked in the word. A person who is soaked in the word has a lot of faith. He is not moved by situations. Why is everybody is terrified? They are not terrified. Because they have the word. It's part of submitting yourself to the Lord. Let me now move on. Number one. How do we resist the devil? Live a righteous and sinless life as much as you possibly can. 1 John 3 verse 8 says, The one who practices sin is of the devil. Who practices, not, not who fall in sin, but who what? Practices. It's like you, you practice it every time. He is of the devil. So try to live as righteous, as sinless, as possible. If the Bible says something is sin, please move away from it. Or ask the Lord to help you to move away from it if you can't move away from it on your own. There are some things that, you know, we can't just, we struggle to do it. Ask the Lord and see how he can help you. If you practice sin, you can't resist the devil and he can't flee away because he is the father of sin. So you are playing in the field of the devil. Then how can you resist him. Right. This is not, not to say, you know, a child of God cannot fall. Because that's not just true. We can fall. But that's not practicing sin. We fall and we stand up and we move on. David says, I fall, out, I fall how many times? Seven times. But I stand up and move on. If it is more than seven, now you are practicing. <laughs> In John 14 verse 30, Jesus said, For the ruler of the world is coming, and he has nothing in me. Who is the ruler of the world that Jesus was talking about? The devil. But he has what? 
nothing in me. In other words, I, I am righteous. So the devil cannot pinpoint sin or anything in me. So he cannot overcome me. That's why Jesus could tell the devil, get away, Satan, from me. Because the devil did not have anything in Jesus. So as a child of God, let me tell you, when you receive Jesus, Paul says, it's no longer me who lives, right? So when you receive Jesus, Jesus is in you now. It's no longer who, you who lives. It's Christ who lives in you, through you. Therefore, you can resist the devil. That's why the Bible says we have righteousness that comes from Christ. The righteousness that we have is not of our own. It is the righteousness that comes through Christ Jesus. So that's the righteousness that you have to bestow. And if that righteousness is upon you of Christ Jesus, and you do, that's why I said as you possibly can, and as you also diligently, vigilantly live a righteous life, you see that the devil is a defeated fool in that sense. You can easily overcome him. The devil finds it very difficult to oppress or to suppress a person who lives a righteous and a holy life. He ends up fleeing away. Number two, I call it crowding. <coughs> crowding. From the word crowd. Crowding. <laughs> it's a method of resisting the devil and you flee away. By crowding, what I mean is make your environment filled with godliness. Make your environment filled with what? With godliness. How do you do that practically? A person who's always listening to gospel music, the blood of Jesus, victory in Christ Jesus, and I've challenged you that if you listen one gospel song every day, you die before you finish them. Yes, there are more than probably by now a million gospel songs, right? I don't think you're going to live a million years. So if you listen just one gospel song every day, they will outlive you. So make sure that your environment has Christian music. Your environment is the word. Thank God for technology. You know, sometimes when uh, I'm traveling, I can just put the word, Mark, and there's someone who's reading the book of Mark, and you are just absorbing the book of Mark, right? You are cr crowding your space to be spirit-filled. Spiritual hymns, those who are older, they enjoy spiritual hymns. Those who are younger, they enjoy radio music. That's fine, as long as it's what? Christian music. Pray in tongues. Pray in the spirit all the times. We talked about that uh, last week. Listening to sermons. If you want to listen to one sermon every day, you die before you finish them. You know? Just be a person who surrounds your life and yourself with the things of the Spirit. That's what I call crowding. When you do that, you find out that the devil will flee away. The devil will flee away. This is the strategy that we use mostly after deliverance. When a person has been delivered and we cast out the devil, we tell the person that, you know what, just crowd your environment. And you see that the devil becomes weaker and weaker and weaker and weaker. He does not live when the blood of Jesus is being preached or is being sung and he lives. And number three, proclaim the blood of Jesus including taking Holy Communion. Revelation eleven twelve says, and the devil was defeated by pleading the blood of Jesus and the word of our testimony. So how can you plead the blood of Jesus? When you go to your hotel, soak the hotel in the blood of Jesus. Soak your bed in the blood of Jesus. In your homes, you have some time that you just, you know, soak everything in the blood, in prayer. In your cars, soak everything in the blood of Jesus. Let me tell you something which is very practical. Most of us, we have bought cars which are second hand. There may be just very few people who have just gone to buy a car which is just new and you remove the papers. But you don't know how many people have owned the car. Craig Rist can tell you the people, but they, he doesn't tell you the spiritual content of the people. The car that you're using could have been used for sex trafficking. 
The car that you are using today could have been used for murder. The car that you are using today, it could be people who divorced and they to sell the properties. So you don't even know. A person who was doing drugs is, was driving the car that you finally bought. A person who had the spirit of this and that was driving the car. And we know spirits live in the environment. So when you buy that car, I have heard people who say, our marriage was so perfect. And we were doing very well. When we just buy that Cadillac, we started to have problems. I don't even know where the problems come from. Right? So you are a person who is spiritual. You are a person who's going to take anointing oil. You are going to go with the word of God. You are going to speak the word of God to that car. And you are going to say any sin that has been done in this car, it will not stay in this car. I bind it and I disconnect it in the name of Jesus. And you plead the blood and you anoint this car. And you declare that from now onwards this car belongs to the Lord. God, you are the one who is on the steering of this car. I can even sleep. And I'm not going to have an accident. You protect me. This car now belongs to the Lord. At that point in time when you submit this car unto the Lord, then the enemy no longer has any, any power. So proclaim the blood of Jesus. Speak the blood of Jesus. Because the devil was defeated by the blood of Jesus. And, 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 and the things of the Spirit, the Bible says they are foolishness to the carnal mind. You know that verse, right? Those things, they, to an intellectual mind, they can appear to be stupid. Honestly, it appears to be stupid to buy your car and, you know, come with anointing oil and say, Lord, in the name of Jesus, this is, I'm now a new owner of this car. If there's any spirit that has ever had residence in this place, I command it to lose hold and live. If there's any divorce that happened with this car, I am not going to have divorce in my family. You pray. It appears stupid. That's why the Bible, this is the things of the spirit, looks foolish. But actually you are using authority in Christ Jesus. Do not take anything for chance. You are using authority to drive out anything that is of the, of the devil. Number four, speak the word of God to situations. Speak the word of God to situations. When the devil was following Christ to the wilderness, when Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights, and he followed him there to tempt him, what did Jesus do? He spoke the word. It is written. It is written. It is written. What was he doing? He was resisting the devil. He resisted him with the word. He resisted him with the word. You have a child who is struggling in school. Speak to that child. Go ahead. Come over. From today onwards, you excel in math. You excel in all sciences. You excel in commercials. You are going to excel in arts. You are a child of God. You don't have the spirit of deafness and dampness. Because that's the spirit which is behind. We bind that spirit out of you. You are going to have a sharp mind. You are going to have a clarity of mind. And just speak that to your child. Whether the child is there or not. You start to see the devil giving way. You start to see the devil what? Giving way. Jesus was talking to people, to diseases, to demons. He talked to everything. And tell them what to do. And they did what Jesus said. Because of the authority. That authority is now given to who? To you. You are now supposed to use that authority. So speak the word of God. Speak it is written. When you speak especially the word of God itself. What is really in the word. You start to see that the devil has no chance. And I don't want you to think that you just speak it once and the devil lives. Because even in the situation of Jesus. He had to speak it how many times? Three times. For him to end up living. So speak the word of God. When you are sick or your child is sick. Your first thought is not supposed to be clinic or doctor. Your first thought is as to what? Speak the word of God. Father in the name of Jesus. I thank you for my child. I see that my child is sick right now. You sickness. I command you in the name of Jesus. To lose word and live. Anoint the child. Then you can take the child to the doctor. 
Then if the child is healed, I know that some of you think, that, well, my doctor is the best doctor. No, it's God. Number five, declare the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus is the highest name with all authority on earth and in heaven. All authority has been given to Christ Jesus. And his name is above every name. And when the name of Jesus is mentioned, every knee shall, every tongue shall, right. So it is a name that has a lot of power, a lot of authority. It carries a lot of authority. In the name of Jesus, demons leave their, their host. In the name of Jesus, the blind saw, the paralyzed uh, were reinstated. The dead even come back to life. Satan is terrified by the name of Jesus. So there is authority in the name of Jesus. There is authority in the name of Jesus. So speak the name of Jesus to situations. That's the authority that you have. Speak the name of Jesus and the name of Jesus itself clears whatever needs to be cleared. There is a lot of authority in the blood of Jesus and in the name of Jesus. That's why we pray in the name of Jesus. And he didn't say, just say it once. I know that, you know, other churches, they pray the whole prayer. And at the end of the day, they say, we pray this in the name of Jesus, which is great. As Pentecostal, we don't feel great, good. <laughs> we want to name it several times. In the name of Jesus, you power of darkness, we bind you and we disconnect you. We overcome you by the blood of Jesus. And we mention the name of Jesus and overcome the name of Jesus. Let me finish up. Number six, wear the shield of faith and the belt of truth. Satan is the father of all lies and he cannot stand the truth. So whenever you are a person of truth, you see that the enemy is defeated. You resist the devil by the truth. You resist the devil by faith. So use your faith to resist the devil. And this is what I mean practically. Um, you went to this interview. You did not get a job. Do not lose hope. Apply again. Whether to another job or back there when they advertise. There's a lady at the University of Michigan who applied the same position five times. Same department, five times. The first time, they did not even shortlist her. The second time, they called her for an interview. Someone get the job. The third time, I'm talking of new positions coming in the same department over time. And she continued applying. The fourth time, they did not even call her. They say, hey, this one is a, is a frequent visitor. The fifth time, they say, ha, this lady is always, let's, let, let's call her. There, there was a new, uh, new department head. And says, yeah, we saw that you have been applying, you know, almost like every, every year in our positions. And uh, we see that you are adjuncting somewhere. Uh, they ask their questions and why she wants to come to this department, this university. And they gave her a job. She ended up being the dean over there. So there was what? Faith. So he has faith in the Lord. And he is able to do it for you. Satan cannot stand faith. After he beats you down, he expects you to surrender. If you are a woman of faith who does not easily surrender, he ends up fleeing away from you. He ends up fleeing away from you. I want to finish up by talking this thing. <coughs> As we fight against the enemy, the devil, we do not fight against flesh and blood. We fight against principalities, powers, rulers, and spiritual hosts. But what happens now in physical life is Perhaps at your workplace, you guys are going to be working. There is just someone who hates you with perfect hatred. And that person will make your life miserable. That person will put all sorts of obstacles for you to lose your job. How do you pray in that situation? 
the natural feeling is to pray against the person. Because inside of you, you are angry at the, the person. And I understand it's a natural reaction. How about if you know that someone is trying to kill you? Not spiritually, but physically. Someone is trying to kill you. You have found that information. How do you pray about that situation? You need to identify your enemy. Your enemy is the devil. Fle it's not flesh and blood. It's not the human being. It's not flesh and blood. Find out what is behind this person. This person may have a Jezebel spirit. Now you identify your real enemy. Whether it's a ruler or a principality or a power, a host, now you realize this is my enemy. So instead of you being angry and bitter and whatever to the person, which you may end up even in the side of sinning, you have to deal with the spirit. You, the Jezebel spirit, spirit of manipulation and control, that does not want me to have peace at my workplace. That is causing this person to compete with me and to block me in everything that I'm doing. You, Jezebel spirit, I bind you and I disconnect you in the blood of Jesus. If I want to use authority and agreement, I'm going to tell Van Dyke, Brother Van Dyke, I have this situation, let's hold hands and we are going to pray together. I'm now using one chest is a thousand, two chest is two thousand. What are we targeting? The Jezebel spirit that is behind. When the Jezebel spirit that is behind is paralyzed, you see that the person does not have any power. But if we are going to pray against the person, we may now sin. How about if it's God who has put that person for your, for your good? Because God sometimes puts people like that for your good. That's what happened with um, Joseph, isn't it? God put all those people in his line so that at the end of the day, he is going to go through all this difficult training and he ends up a prime minister. So he could not spend his time praying against his brothers. Right? So know what you are dealing with in the spirit. Us coming from Africa, just give me two minutes to finish. Us coming from Africa, we deal with a lot of witchcraft. And I'm not saying everything is witchcraft. No. There was a witch of Endo in the Bible. And you know where you come from. Sometimes you hate that uncle or that auntie who is fighting you. No. The spirit behind, that is what you need to target. Know that this is the spirit of witchcraft, which is the spirit of the devil. So you are going to use all the spiritual armory weapons. For our weapons of warfare, they are not carnal, but they are spiritual through God, to the pulling down of strongholds and anything else that exalts itself against the wisdom and the knowledge of God. So you are going to use spiritual arm against the spirit of witchcraft. And when you paralyze the spirit of witchcraft, you realize that you have overcome. So I want you to, to stand up and we are going to pray today. We are still talking about authority. We know our enemy and we know how he functions. We know how he fights against us. And we know that he wants uh, us to fight against flesh and blood, against each other, instead of fighting against the spirit that is behind, whether it's a principality or a power. So today we just want to go before the Lord. The first thing we want to surrender. Just want you on your own to surrender. Surrender things about your life. Surrender things about your life. You are in a relationship that you know that it's not a good relationship. But you are still hanging in the relationship. But you want to get married. It doesn't work like that. You have to surrender your dating life or courtship life, whatever the right word is. Lord, I want to get married in a year or two years. Please, Lord, bring the right person. We know situations of the right person coming in January by much people are waiting. So, I surrender. If you do not surrender that area, you are going to prolong it. You are on your own, you are going to prolong it. So if there's anything that you feel like you want to surrender, I know that right now is time for us to apply 
or we have already got a letter of admission uh, to two, three universities and great, we thank God and God is so wonderful to the children of God. Then now you are thinking where to go. Which one should I go? Surrender those three admissions to God and let God speak, son, this is where you are going so that you are going to be in the right place at the right time. If you end up in the wrong city, you know, Texas had uh, a little bit of uh, snow over the weekend. And there was a little bit of freezing. And he also said, I'm going to Texas. Texas is my place. I'm just giving an example. I'm, 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 I don't have anything against Texas. So I just want you to surrender your decisions. Surrender your businesses. Surrender your life. Surrender your resources. Surrender your heart. Surrender your children. Surrender your marriage. I want you just to surrender. Surrender in the name of Jesus. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you this morning and we bless your holy name. 